tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Charged with masterminding her murder, Jassy Sidhu's mother and uncle make their first court appearance in India. Also. I think we never trusted politicians to begin with. So there you go. I don't think we should be at all surprised. Public confidence in our politicians takes a hit from the legislature spending scandal. And most of the appeal is just freedom. A False Creek live aboard navigates legal waters to scuttle charges of illegal anchoring. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The mother and uncle of a Maple Ridge woman killed in Punjab more than 18 years ago have made their first appearance in a courtroom in India. Malkit Sidhu and Sarjeet Badesha were extradited from Canada earlier this week to face charges of conspiracy to commit murder. As the CBC's Valpuri reports tonight, while the criminal proceedings against the accused have finally begun, Jassy Sidhu's widower still can't bear to face them. For years, the two BC residents have been fighting a long legal battle to stay here in Canada and avoid facing charges in India. But now their fate is in the hands of lawyers and judges in Punjab. It was a somewhat dramatic first appearance. Surjit Singh Badesha and Mulkit Kaur Sidhu arrived with their faces covered, escorted by police and greeted by a crowd of reporters. Who uh, come uh, to came there uh, with a black uh, cover on their face and only they can see with their eyes. Uh, uh, so for the, from the body language, I, I don't think so that... Uh, uh, what is the reaction, what was the reaction of uh, the two duo uh, at that time because uh, we were not able to see their, see their faces. It's not clear why the two wore bags on their head, but Punjabi media believe it has to do with keeping them safe in India. Canada's Department of Justice has yet to release more information on the conditions of the extradition. Badesha and Sidhu are accused of planning the murder of Jazzy Sidhu because they didn't like who she secretly married in India. Mitu, they say said was beneath them. Former journalist Fabian Dawson has followed the story from the start since spring 2000. He's not convinced there will be justice for Jazzy. The Indian chapter of this story opens up now and I hope I'm wrong here but my belief is that the chances of them getting an acquittal are pretty high in India. Now 38, Jazzy's husband Mithu has never remarried and continues to mourn the loss of his wife. He was not in court to see his in-laws face their charges. Badesha and Sidhu appeared briefly before a judge. They'll be held in custody for another four days before they make their next appearance. Belpuri, CBC News, Vancouver. A declaration of innocence tonight from one of two senior B.C. legislature staffers accused in a spending scandal. Craig James says he will be issuing a response to the Speaker's report on his expenses soon. Uh, I've been focusing on responding to the Speaker's report uh, and we're expecting that it will be <clears throat> in the hands of uh, the Legislative Assembly Management Committee uh, toward the end of next week or before the first. Do you think that you'll be vindicated? We're expecting to be, yes. I w I'm not going to comment on any aspect of the Speaker's uh, report right now. I think that would be inappropriate. Uh, but all of that will be laid out in detail uh, in, the, in, the, in, in our response. And that damning report has turned political, with all sides in B.C.'s legislature blaming each other. But what do this week's revelations do for public confidence in politics? Our provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher is finding out. I never fully, really trusted the government in the beginning. I mean, it makes me not trust them a little bit, you know? Like, I'm skeptical. Like, how are they using our money? British Columbians have had several days now to digest all 76 pages of the report, and it's not sitting well. It's unacceptable because we, as a taxpayer, you know, you should know where the money's going, right? There's overspending in a lot of places and not a lot of checks and balances, so it's kind of to be expected. Who has trust in the government anyway? And it's that type of attitude that worries UBC political scientist Gerald Beyer. And this might be a case where it turns some people off to think, oh, all these guys are crooks, they're all the same. Uh, and so the more we talk about it, the more outrageous it seems, uh, you know, the more, uh, more that, that attitude gets in, kind of entrenched in, in the public's mind. An important distinction to make, the clerk and sergeant at arms are not politicians. They're senior staff who are appointed, not elected. But it's a distinction that may be lost on many. So this time it is, it is sort of senior management of the assembly, the people who are more permanent uh, in some ways, but at the same time it's just casting it all uh, with a bad brush. 
Politicians or not, government watchdogs say there are still key officials who need to be held accountable. And it's the responsibility, not just of elected officials, but also senior staff to respect that environment and to make certain that when they spend a tax dollar, that it's well spent. As we await the results of a forensic audit and RCMP investigation, there are calls for greater transparency now. The Legislative Assembly Management Committee should put deadlines uh, on their work so that the public knows that we will not go into another election with these policies in place, but modern policies appropriate uh, to a work environment in 2019. Many say while the spending scandal likely won't change who people vote for, it could likely affect whether they vote at all. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Charges have now been approved in the case of a brazen West End sex assault last November. Tyler Emerson Gagnon is accused of following a woman into her Butte Street apartment and assaulting her before fleeing. He was arrested a day later on an unrelated matter. Mr. Gagnon, at the time uh, of the offense, he was identified as a person who also we released a, we did a media release on this person, also as a high-risk offender who was missing from his halfway house. So it was a, through a combination of public tips and uh, some heads up members of the public that were able to locate him um, and we arrest him the next day. Gagnon was on parole at the time of his arrest. He was previously sentenced to five years and nine months for a litany of charges, including robbery, assault, break and enter, possession of stolen property, and dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. A Vancouver police officer has been charged with dangerous driving causing bodily harm. The province's police watchdog alleges the on-duty officer hit a pedestrian. The accident happened last January on Vancouver's east side. When it was over, shoes were found lying in the street. The pedestrian suffered serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Since the case is now before the courts, neither the Independent Investigations Office nor the Crown are releasing more details. A Vancouver man charged with 16 counts of anchoring a vessel without a permit in False Creek has appeared in court. Sean Wilson plans to fight the charges and now after more than two years, a date has been set for a trial. And as Rafferty Baker reports, no matter what happens, Wilson is vowing to continue living on his boat. Stage is going to help us here. There you go. Sean Wilson has always been around the water. His Belgian shepherd, Sage, is trained to hop onto the dock, grab the rope, and pull Wilson's dinghy in to help tie up. Wilson has lived in Vancouver's Falls Creek since about 2005, anchoring for free and living a modest boat life. We learned to conserve a lot on a boat. He earns his living on the water, working as a caretaker for other boaters and helping to rescue vessels that drag anchor or run aground. But the lifestyle isn't free of hassle. Vancouver police officers regularly come around. They issue warnings or tickets to enforce anchoring rules in False Creek. Boats can stay up to eight hours a day as long as they're gone by 11 p.m. It is possible to stay overnight if they get a free permit. But there's a limit on the number of overnight stays per month. Over the years, Wilson has caught the attention of police, and he now faces 16 counts of anchoring in False Creek without a permit, charges he's trying to fight in court. Wilson has a second-year UBC law student helping him navigate the legal waters. And he says whatever happens, he's committed to the boat life. I guess the, most of the appeal is just freedom. You're, you're free from stratas and, and rules when you're in a boat. If you don't like your neighbors, you can just move, move your home. You don't have to do any packing. But Wilson likes his neighbors where he drops anchor. There are other boat people like him, all doing their best to avoid police enforcement. Well, there's about a dozen of us that live in the creek permanently, full time. And, and it, it ends up, I guess, sometimes it's like a cat and mouse thing because you're allowed to be anchored eight hours a day indefinitely in Fouts Creek. By shuffling their boats around and heading out to English Bay when the weather is decent, Wilson says he and the boat community try to stay out of trouble. They pump their sewage for free at the public marinas. His trial is scheduled for three days in June. He says if he loses, he'll figure out how to pay the fine and continue dropping anchor in Falls Creek. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver.
The cost of fixing the White Rock damaged pier has been revealed, and it's considerably more than city staff had hoped. A new report says the repairs could cost as much as $16 million, depending on the type of materials used. White Rock Mayor Daryl Walker had originally estimated a new pier would cost between five and six million. The 500 meter long pier was cut in two when some unmoored boats slammed into it during a windstorm last month. The pier was insured for about seven million, but city officials aren't sure how much of the damage insurance will end up covering. Mortality rates, diabetes, and smoking during pregnancy are all down in this province, according to BC's top doctor. Dr. Bonnie Henry's report today shows the overall health of British Columbians is good, but there are a few trends that she notes are of concern, including fruit and vegetable consumption being down, also hazardous drinking behavior. For the first time in 30 years, we've seen life expectancy at birth creep down by about three months, and a large proportion of that is because young people are dying from this overdose crisis, and it's particularly affecting young men. And we know that um, it's mostly about 80% of the people who are dying in this crisis are young men. Dr. Henry is also asking that a larger percentage of health authorities' budgets be allocated to public health programs. Two lower mainland emergency rooms are getting facelifts. The province announced it is spending more than $120 million to improve White Rock's Peace Arch Hospital, as well as Langley Memorial Hospital. The goal is to improve efficiency in both ERs by upping their ability to handle an ever-growing number of patients. But what we normally do is we triage different types of patients into different uh, care uh, pathways. So with the expanded space as well as expanded number of uh, rooms available, trauma bay uh, expansion, all of those will help us triage and uh, ensure that they're in the right pathway. The improvements at Langley Memorial are expected to be complete by late 2020, with Peace Arch's upgrades finishing in late 2021. Well, residents in North Vancouver are complaining about discharge into a popular fish-bearing creek. The usually clear stream has been more of a murky gray color. One man's fed up. He's tried to get the government to step in, but as our John Hernandez reports, he's run into a bureaucratic wall. That's a... Uh spill that's happening this is number six in about a week and a half roy Mulder has had enough at least that's what he says in this rant he posted on social media where he points out a murky gray discharge that's running through north vancouver's wag creek this is one of your fish bearing creeks and uh it's being spilled into on a daily basis i'm getting really really fed up with this Nobody's paying attention. Wag uh, Creek runs down the north shore into the Burrard Inlet and is known to support local wildlife. But for a number of years, Mulder has documented what he says is an increasing amount of pollution. He says he's reported it to the city, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Environment Canada, but not much has been done. And I noticed that this wasn't happening just at one point in the creek. This was happening at a couple points in the creek. And this has been ongoing. This is something I've seen in the 10 years I've lived there. I think I'm at spill number 17 now. Mulder isn't alone in his concerns. His video generated thousands of views since it was posted online. And many visitors walking through the park today have also seen the alleged contamination. I notice sometimes some, some odd color after heavy rain, there's a whitish sort of uh, colour to the water, yeah. But definitely something's coming into there. From time to time it does become milky. It's pretty clear that people think that it's just a good way to get rid of whatever down the sewer is. Mulder suspects waste from construction sites within the water catchment area is making its way into drains. He's frustrated his efforts to report it have fallen on deaf ears. Just going one department is passing it to the other department who's passing it back and it just keeps going back and forth. But nobody's saying, hey, how can we work together on this? Since the stream is allegedly contaminated, it ultimately falls under Environment Canada's jurisdiction. Officials say they're waiting on more evidence before taking action. John Hernandez, CBC News, North Vancouver. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart wants to improve the city's empty home tax. A new motion will review the tax's fairness and explore what could happen if it was increased. As it sits right now, the levy charges owners 1% of a vacant property's assessed value. 
Tax was introduced back in 2017 in hopes of easing the city's rental crunch. Stewart campaigned last fall to triple the rate. Amy Bell is here now with the first look at the weather and Amy, I have got my sunglasses all ready to go. <laughs> They're all set? Okay. Yeah. yeah. You're going to need them probably by tomorrow afternoon. But today, we had a few little glimpses of the sunshine, so that I think that gave everybody hope. The ceiling was just a little bit higher, so it didn't feel quite as sort of uh, dreary, and we didn't have that drizzle. So that's great. Tomorrow will be a transition day. Weather or temperature-wise, uh, seeing things a little bit cooler today. Uh, just five right now in Vancouver, seven for Port Hardy. A little warmer, though, in Port St. John today, four degrees. And we will see things cooling off as we head throughout the weekend and into early next week. But that's for a good reason. Uh, for the next 24 hours, though, we're finally going to see just enough of a breeze to help sort of shift some of that cloud in the second half of the day. So even though we'll start off gray tomorrow with some fog and some drizzle, uh, there is going to be a transition in the afternoon. We'll start to see some sunshine. The biggest change though will come Sunday. So uh, get ready for that. We'll be cooler on Sunday and Monday with brilliant sunny skies. But by tomorrow around lunch hour, we're going to start to see that sunshine and we're not going to see any precipitation until sort of Tuesday next week. Sounds good. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Well, it was once a small logging town, but the district of Squamish has been a city on the rise for years, even featured in the New York Times. Tonight, our Justin McElroy reports on what that growth has done to the population and the double-edged sword of all that attention. What happens when you're a small town and your population goes up and up and up? This week we're in Squamish, where the population growth over the last two decades has created tremendous opportunities but also challenges. Even on a cloudy day, it's clear to see why Squamish has become so popular. The hiking, the oceans, the proximity to Vancouver, the new tourist attractions like the gondola. It's all meant that many, many young families have moved to the area in the last decade. But with all that growth come challenges and a conflict between the newer generation and the older one who remembers Squamish the way it was. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of bridging our community and reaching out to all folks who live here. Jenna Stoner is one of many millennials who moved to Squamish this decade for the lifestyle and affordability. Now she's a city councillor, dealing with the ramifications of others, just like her, coming in. How do we actually start to foster this sense of community with both the old and the new and the returning? And um, so I think that that needs to be done by engaging our citizenship a little bit more. Only four BC municipalities have grown by more than 30% in the last 10 years. But Squamish is the only one not directly connected to an urban centre, which means a few growing pains for new residents. We don't have sidewalks everywhere. Karen Elliott became mayor in October, six years after moving to Squamish herself. Her biggest priority is managing the growth. But how do we do that in a thoughtful way, in a way that preserves some of the things we love about Squamish? You know. Our vision statement says we're a small town with a big heart, and, and we don't want to lose that. Susan Chappelle was a councillor for seven years before losing to Elliott for mayor. She worries there will be too many people and not enough infrastructure for businesses and transportation. Squamish has so much potential, uh, but realizing that potential requires thinking not just about resi residentialization and where people live, but also where people work and where people play. Bridging all those gaps will be the biggest challenge as Squamish continues its transition from a small to medium-sized town. But with a mix of young and old on council, they're all hopeful they can continue to keep Squamish what made them come here in the first place. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Squamish. Well, we now know a pair of raids in Kingston, Ontario, were all part of a terror investigation. And while two people were arrested, including a minor, only one has been charged. David Cochran has the latest. This street, this house, the focus of a national counterterrorism operation. We did receive credible FBI information regarding a, a, an attack plot uh, with no specific time, date, or location affixed to it. That tip launched a multi-agency investigation involving 300 people. The immediate result, an unnamed minor arrested and charged with plotting to build a bomb and detonate it in a public place. 
the individual was uh, reported to be involved in the manufacturing of homemade improvised explosive devices, and that was one of the subjects of our investigation. Police raided the home of the minor on Thursday afternoon. I mean, it's always surprising to come home from school and then seeing a whole bunch of cars and vans and police everywhere. At the same time, they raided this house a few kilometers away, the home of a Syrian refugee family. They arrested but have not charged 20-year-old Hussam Adin al-Zahabi. His family would not talk on camera today, but Amin al-Zahabi told CBC by phone his oldest son was arrested. I know my son. He, he, he didn't. He, he cannot think about that. He like Canada. He like the, the safety in Canada. How could he think about that? At no time was the city of Kingston or any Canadian area under direct threat. The police focused heavily on reassuring people they were safe, despite simultaneous counter-terrorism raids in residential neighborhoods. The specifics of how this alleged plot was working and what the motive might be were left for another day, as the police say they won't discuss the specifics of the investigation. David Cochran, CBC News, Kingston. Donald Trump's former campaign advisor has been arrested and charged in Florida. Roger Stone was picked up by the FBI at his home this morning and has denounced the charges against him. This is a politically motivated investigation. Uh, I am troubled by the political motivations of the prosecutors. Uh, and as I have said previously, there is no circumstance whatsoever under which I will bear false witness against the president. The indictment is part of Robert Mueller's investigation into Trump campaign ties to Russia. Stone is charged with witness tampering, obstruction, and lying to Congress. He's the sixth Trump associate to be charged in the special counsel's Russia investigation. He's now out on a $250,000 bond, and he says he will plead not guilty. And the U.S. government shutdown is over for now. Trump struck a deal with the Democrats to reopen the government, but only for three weeks. In the meantime, negotiations over his proposal to build a wall along the Mexican border will continue. Kim Brunhuber has more on this latest development. I am very proud to announce today that we have reached a deal to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. There are synonyms, of course, other ways of saying it, but it's hard not to see this announcement as essentially President Trump caving. After the longest shutdown in history, Trump reopened the government without getting a penny for the wall he so desperately wants to build. We really have no choice but to build a powerful wall or steel barrier. The shutdown has stretched for more than a month. 35 days without pay for hundreds of thousands of federal workers. Many, like these TSA agents in Newport Beach, California, resorting to food banks to make ends meet. We can't really do anything about it besides just hang on and wait for our paycheck to come in. Several of you are asking about connecting flights. Um, this is an issue due to a ground stop here in LaGuardia due to the government shutdown. Today, there were significant delays at some airports because of a shortage of air traffic controllers. The growing chaos no doubt played some role in today's announcement, but this deal to reopen the government while both sides try to discuss funding for more border security is what Democrats and even some Republicans had proposed before the shutdown even began. Democrats say they hope the president learned his lesson. Ultimately, this agreement endorses our position. It reopens the government without preconditions, gives Democrats and Republicans an opportunity to discuss border security without holding hundreds of thousands of American workers hostage. If we don't get a fair deal from Congress... The two parties have three weeks to strike a deal. If they don't, Trump is threatening to declare a state of emergency or perhaps order yet another government shutdown. With many still wondering what exactly this shutdown was all for. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Newport Beach, California. No doubt it was a week of twists and turns at the B.C. legislature following Monday's bombshell report from the House Speaker. New senior legislature staffers are facing allegations of questionable spending. And as Tanya Fletcher explains, the scandal has been slowly simmering for months.
A 76-page bombshell report from the Speaker of the House is made public, alleging a spectacular spending scandal. At the centre of it all, two senior officials at the BC Legislature. Here's a look back at how it all unfolded. A motion to suspend Clerk Craig James and Sergeant-at-Arms Gary Lenz passes unanimously in the House. Effective immediately. When the motion was introduced in the House a few minutes ago, did, did you get any kind of formal heads up before? Oh, nothing at all. Do you have any idea what this is pertaining to? No, I don't. And neither does the Sergeant-at-Arms. They're escorted out of the building. Alan Mullen, a special advisor to the Speaker, addresses media and says RCMP are conducting an investigation. As far as I know, it is absolutely unprecedented, and if I can be frank, I mean, it's, it's disturbing. The next day, Mullen speaks at a news conference and reveals he was brought on last year after concerns were raised by Speaker Daryl Plekis. I was brought in for, for a number of different reasons in January. Uh, there, there, was, there was just regular concerns about a lot of different things. Mullen says he relayed his findings to the RCMP in August. Good morning. The opposition demands an end to the secrecy. All we can say at this point is that the public are entitled to know the truth about events of this week, and we're doing our level best to get those facts on the table. I'm sure you will find it interesting what I have to say this afternoon. Will you be making a statement yourself? I will be making a statement. But the speaker later decides not to address the media. Instead, Mullen offers this statement. Okay, folks, I'm not taking any questions. I'm just going to read a statement. I am confirming that the Speaker has requested a second Special Advisor to advise on all things legal. The second Special Advisor is the Honourable Justice Wally Opal. Second Special Advisor Wally Opal then defends Plekis's handling of the situation. If there is an investigation going on, the particulars of that investigation should not be revealed to the public uh, because it may compromise the selection of a fair jury in due course and all of those prejudice the right to a fair trial. The two suspended officials hold a news conference. I know I've done nothing wrong. It's not an issue of, of anything that I've done that's going to be coming out. Let the process continue. Let the investigation take place. I am left in the position of not being able to respond because no one has told me what the allegations are. An awkward moment ensues in the chambers when the opposition proposes an emergency debate over the handling of the suspensions. Last week on... Uh, uh, Member, if I may ask, if this matter pertains to my office, uh, I ought to recuse myself? Followed by strong words from Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson. There's a grave concern that the Speaker's out of control. Speakers have been around for 640 years, and there's no precedent anywhere in the British Commonwealth for the conduct of this Speaker in the last week. The public deserves full disclosure. Yes. Boy, are they going to get it. Plekis calls for a meeting to discuss a full forensic audit of the offices of the Speaker and the two suspended officials. And if the outcome of those audits did not outrage the public, did not outrage taxpayers, did not make them throw up, I will resign as Speaker. This is a report. A bombshell report by Plekis is made public. The Speaker accuses Craig James and Gary Lenz of flagrant overspending, questionable expenses and inappropriate payouts in the range of a million dollars. James and Lenz have not been charged with any crime and continue to deny the allegations. And the weekend is here. here. Yeah. The weekend is here. The weekend's Almost. here. Amy yes. Bell's here. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. And we're going to get some sunshine, too. So that's even better. Uh, yeah, we didn't have the best week, all in all. A little dreary in many days. And uh, we'll see that again tomorrow morning. But we are going to see a change. Uh, we're going to get into some sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. But today we saw that sort of low cloud and drizzle to start. But we did have some breaks in the clouds and little sunny spots here and there. So I think that was just uh, giving us a little brief glimpse of what we're going to see in the second half of tomorrow and then uh, after we get through tomorrow's transition day we're going to get into even more sunshine for Sunday and Monday so uh, you will see a little bit of precipitation in some areas we still have this ridge of high pressure it's been a weak one uh, and it has allowed all that cloud and uh, fog in but it's kept the major systems away so that's all funneled up to the northern half of the province we will still see some showers and rain up north and then coming down towards Alberta and along the north and central coast you will get some rain but we're really in good shape for the week and once we get through some cloud and fog tomorrow morning, we'll brighten up right around lunchtime. 
a little bit later out in the Fraser Valley, but certainly uh, more widespread as the day continues. We could see a little bit of cloud sneaking in Saturday night, but then Sunday is the real standout and gorgeous really for the central and southern interior tomorrow and down into the Kootenays. Uh, we will see more sun Sunday. Cool though, we'll get down to zero on the overnights and just six, five or six for the high. A little bit cooler even for Monday with that sunshine once again. And then another transition on Tuesday. We'll start to see some showers Tuesday night and then into Wednesday is when we see that next significant rainfall. So really the uh, very unsettled weather and dreary weather we've seen for most of the week is coming to an end tomorrow. Uh, and so that second half of the day, if you're doing anything outdoors, I would hold off until lunch, but then have at her all day on Sunday and Monday. It's gonna be gorgeous. Okay, thanks, Amy. You're Can't welcome. Wait. Well, the 1015 ferry from Tawasson to Duke Point carried a very special passenger to the island today. Theo, the 800-pound pig finally traveled to his new home after spending the last eight months uncertain of where his hooves would land. <laughs> Theo was found wandering near Fraser Highway last spring, but no one claimed him. The Langley Animal Protection Society was worried they may never find him a suitable home until a sanctuary in Duncan came forward. So today, Theo set sail for his new habitat, complete with all the amenities. It even has a female pig that sanctuary owners hope will eventually be Theo's girlfriend. Well, that's a good deal. Yeah. A little overseas trip and... And he gets a girlfriend? There you go. That's not bad, eh? <laughs> Not bad at all. Well, thanks for watching us on Facebook or YouTube. We're going to be on television on CBC at 8.30 after the NHL skills competition. Mm -hmm. Have a good night.